When American engineers finished the Panama Canal in 1904, the security of the Caribbean and Central America becomes a focus of U.S. foreign policy. President Theodore Roosevelt claims the right to intervene anywhere in the region in order to control the sea lanes to the new canal. Civil wars and coups are a way of life in the region as governments change every couple of years. A decade after the canal is completed, the interventions begin when the Marines arrive in Nicaragua in 1914. When the government of one of these countries fell, that meant that the U.S. had to send forces in then to protect all our business interests. British and uh, German and French had interests as well. And we wanted to stabilize these governments so it wouldn't have European powers coming in. These battles become known as the Banana Wars, since fruit is one of the largest industries in the region. The United Fruit Company wants stability so that they can ship the bananas and other fruits here and there. They saw the need for stability to make capitalism work better. Marine support of stable governments in Nicaragua, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic doesn't always mean supporting the general population. Our forces tended to support more reactionary factions because of the more oppressive, less democratic governments provided greater order and stability. And this meant our forces very often were seen as anything but liberators. One of the Marines' most formidable opponents is Augusto Sandino, a rebel leader in Nicaragua in 1928. Augusto Sandino is sort of the equivalent of Ho Chi Minh in the 1960s. He becomes a world figure representing this idea of the heroic guerrilla struggle against the United States imperialism. But even the charismatic Sandino is no match for well-trained, well-equipped U.S. Marines. In 1929, the Americans drive Sandino and his followers into the mountains. Later generations of rebels familiar to Americans in the 1980s continue the struggle and take their forefather's name, the Sandinistas. Soon after Sandino's defeat, the Marines withdraw and the Banana Wars end after two decades of fighting and over 700 American casualties. Our involvement in these Banana Wars dissipated rather uh, dramatically during the 1930s. America, of course, was preoccupied with the Great Depression. Franklin Roosevelt was attempting to develop better relations with Latin America in general. Then, too, there, there had been a number of dictatorships that had created a certain degree of stability in a number of these nations. The marine presence is controversial, but they do leave certain benefits behind for the local population. In certain ways, they were welcomed as peacekeepers. They introduced baseball, for example. They also introduced, really, sanitation. Some of these peacekeepers become the greatest heroes in the history of the Marine Corps. In an assault on a Haitian fort, the Marines were led by Major Smedley Butler and Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly. In the face of murderous fire, they were able to create a breach in one of the walls of the fort and in a classic Marine headlong dash. They went right through the breach and into the fort. For heroic action on that occasion, Smedley Butler received the Medal of Honor, and so too did Dan Daly. 
Despite their heroics, many of the Marines who fought in the Banana Wars become disillusioned later in their careers. Smedley Butler put it best. I spend most of my time being a high-class muscle man for big business, Wall Street, and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. <laughs> 